The tabulated delta H data also led to the idea of enthalpy of formation delta H sub F naught, often referred to as the heat of formation, and when used in conjunction with Hess's law, is a powerful tool for scientists. The enthalpy of formation is a thermodynamic quantity that measures the change in enthalpy, which is the total heat content, when one mole of a compound is formed from its constituent elements in their standard states at a pressure of one atmosphere and a specified temperature, usually 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin, where it's most stable. From a previous example of carbon plus oxygen going to CO2, we have calculated two enthalpies of formation, carbon monoxides at negative 111 kilojoules per mole and carbon dioxides at negative 394 kilojoules per mole. Not only that, but since we have fully combusted carbon, we now have the standard enthalpy change of combustion, delta H sub C naught, for carbon, which is negative 394 kilojoules per mole. The standard enthalpy change of combustion is the enthalpy change that occurs when one mole of a substance is burned completely in oxygen under standard conditions. But how would this affect allotropes of an element such as diamond and graphite for carbon? Hopefully you intuit that the stronger the bond, the more energy is required to break that bond, and that is exactly the case with the allotropes of graphite and diamond. The standard enthalpy change of combustion, delta H sub C naught, for diamond is less negative, less exothermic, than graphite, indicating that more energy is required to combust diamond. This is due to the additional energy needed to break the stronger bonds in the diamond structure. Let's go through another example. Let's say you combust hydrogen H2 with oxygen to form water. The equation would be H2 plus 1 half O2 going to H2O. You measure the change in enthalpy to be negative 286 kilojoules per mole. What does this tell you about the reaction? First, the negative value signifies it's an exothermic reaction, where 286 kilojoules per mole is released to the surroundings. Next, delta H sub F naught for water would be negative 286 kilojoules per mole, since that was what was formed and what you measured. Not only that, but the delta H sub C naught for hydrogen H2 is negative 286 kilojoules per mole as well, since that was what was combusted. Let's boost the difficulty a little bit with a combustion of propane C3H8 as an example to calculate the enthalpy change using both enthalpy of formation data and enthalpy of combustion data. This balanced equation for the combustion of methane is C3H8 plus 5O2 going to 3CO2 plus 4H2O. The enthalpy of formation data is delta H sub F of C3H8 is negative 105 kilojoules per mole. Delta H sub F of O2 is 0 kilojoules per mole since it's an element in its standard state. Delta H sub F of CO2 is negative 394 kilojoules per mole. And delta H sub F of H2O is negative 286 kilojoules per mole. To calculate the change in enthalpy, we take the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants which would come out to be 3 times negative 394 kilojoules per mole plus 4 times negative 286 kilojoules per mole minus 105 kilojoules per mole plus 0 equals negative 2,221 kilojoules per mole. Comparing that to the enthalpy of combustion delta H sub C naught data for C3H8 equals 2,219 kilojoules per mole, we see that it is roughly equal. Now that we've explored examples of enthalpies of combustion and formation using Hess's law, we can delve into the Born-Haber cycle. This cycle is an application of Hess's law that illustrates the energy changes during the formation of an ionic compound and is vital for the calculation of lattice energies since they cannot be determined directly by experiment. The key steps in a Born-Haber cycle include atomization enthalpy, delta H sub AT. This is the energy change that occurs when one mole of gaseous atoms of an element is formed. This is always positive and therefore endothermic. It is also referred to as the sublimation enthalpy. Next is the sum of ionization energies. This is the total energy needed to remove electrons from a neutral atom to form a cation. This process requires an input of energy, making the values positive. Next is the sum of electron affinities. This is the energy released when electrons are added to a neutral atom to form an anion. Lattice enthalpy, delta H sub lattice, is the energy required to break an ionic solid into its gaseous ions, which is always positive or endothermic. Lastly is the enthalpy of formation that we covered. This is the heat change when one mole of a compound forms from its elements in their standard states. The Born-Haber cycle combines these steps to calculate the lattice enthalpy of an ionic compound, providing insights into the stability of the compound. Lattice energy is important because it explains the stability of ionic solids. Despite their ordered structure and low entropy, 
The crystalline arrangement allows for strong interactions between oppositely charged ions, resulting in favorable enthalpy change and high melting points and boiling points. Some ionic solids decompose before reaching these temperatures, though. The strength of the lattice enthalpy is influenced by the charge and the size of the ions. Higher charges and smaller ionic radii result in stronger lattice enthalpies. The overall equation for the lattice enthalpy of an ionic compound is delta H sub lattice equals negative delta H sub F plus H sub AT plus the sum of IE plus the sum of the EA. To understand how to interpret and determine values, specifically lattice enthalpy from a Born-Haber cycle for compounds composed of univalent and divalent ions, let's examine the formation of KF and MGS, potassium fluoride and magnesium sulfide. Potassium fluoride is for the univalent ions. For potassium fluoride, the formation of the reaction is K plus one half F2 going to KF. The given data includes the enthalpy of atomization of potassium at 89 kilojoules per mole, ionization energy of potassium at 419 kilojoules per mole, electron affinity of chlorine at negative 349 kilojoules per mole, and the enthalpy of formation of KF at negative 569 kilojoules per mole. To calculate the lattice energy for potassium fluoride using the Born-Haber cycle, first list out your known variables. Next, using the equation delta H sub lattice equals negative delta H sub F plus delta H sub AT of potassium plus delta H sub AT of fluorine plus the ionization energies plus the electron affinities, we substitute the given values where delta H sub lattice equals negative negative 569 making it positive plus 89 plus 79 plus 419 minus 349 equals 807 kilojoules per mole. Thus, the lattice energy for potassium fluoride is 807 kilojoules per mole. Next, consider MGS, or magnesium sulfide, with the formation reaction of magnesium plus one half S2 going to MGS. The given data include the enthalpy of atomization of magnesium at 148 kilojoules per mole, first ionization energy of magnesium at 738 kilojoules per mole, second ionization energy of magnesium at 1,451 kilojoules per mole, the atomization of sulfur at 277 kilojoules per mole, first electron affinity of sulfur at negative 200 kilojoules per mole, second electron affinity of sulfur at 545 kilojoules per mole, and the formation of MGS of delta HF equals negative 346 kilojoules per mole. Again, list out your known variables. Next, using the equation delta H sub lattice equals negative delta H sub F plus delta H sub AT of magnesium plus delta H sub AT of sulfur plus the sum of the ionization energies plus the sum of the electron affinities, you substitute your given values. Add everything up and you get 3305 kilojoules per mole. Thus, the lattice energy of magnesium sulfide is 3305 kilojoules per mole. The significant difference highlights the influence of ion charges and sizes on lattice energy. With divalent ions such as magnesium 2 plus and sulfur 2 minus leading to much higher lattice energies due to stronger electrostatic forces compared to univalent ions like potassium K plus and fluoride F minus.